some linear contextual adversarial bandits as well. So really, all of this stuff is just an application of this one big theorem we proved before with different ways of estimating the thing that you don't know, and then, and then not much new. Um, but there are going to be a few fun things along the way, so there's going to be a little bit of stuff on, on experimental design uh, from statistics, which is a useful tool here. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is, is, is bandits with experts. So this is the problem you face. You have a bunch of experts. They're all recommending you uh, which socks you should wear in the morning. It's a difficult decision. And, and so the way it works is every morning you have to make a decision. And you have a number of experts who are recommending what you should do. Maybe a really, really large number of experts. And, and you want to use their advice as, as effectively as possible and, and suffer sort of a, a low regret, not, not with respect to the best action in hindsight, but with respect to the best expert in hindsight. So if there's some good expert, you will identify them quickly. Okay, so how do we, we do this setting? So it's exactly the same as a bandit problem, the, the simple finite armed bandit that we studied before. So you have these, these, these K actions that you can choose, and the adversary is choosing a sequence of losses about how good those actions are. But now we also have a bunch of experts, M experts. And M is usually going to be much larger than K. Like maybe, maybe exponentially larger than K somehow. And the experts, they're saying, I think you should play this action or that action in each round, right? So the way it works is at the beginning of the round, you ask all of the experts what they think you should do. And they tell you, they tell you, I think you should play this little AI of T. That's the thing that expert I says you should do in round T. And then you get to make a decision. You can choose your action from, from one of the K choices. And the regret is, is now measured with respect to the best expert in hindsight, right? So here we have uh, the, the max over all the experts rather than the actions, and then here we have the sum of, of their loss, right? So this, this allows us to move away from this, this very rigid framework. We have to compete with the best action in hindsight. Now we can compete with the best e expert in hindsight. And we'll see we can use this to to use bandits in, in cases where the data is seen on stationary uh, or big combinatorial settings, and we can just use these results here. And the, the important thing here is what we expect our regret to look like. Well, we don't want it to be too big in terms of M. So there's going to be a bunch of examples where M is sort of really, really huge. You could definitely not tolerate having a regret that scaled with M, but maybe log M. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see a, a log dependence on the, on the size of of the number of experts. Okay, but really the analysis is, is completely straightforward. We're just going to plug in the stuff that we already know, estimate our losses, and, and, and it all just works out. So is the, is the setting clear? Yeah. Why do we need large M? We don't need large M, but we're going to see an example where M is really large. And this often happens when um, when you have some sort of combinatorial structure in how the experts are predicting. So the example that we're going to observe in a second is where the experts are recommending fixed sequence of actions but with changes. So we're going to have the set of all experts, uh, experts predicting uh, a sequence that looks like this. Uh, so they're predicting sequences of actions that you should play, or recommending, I guess, A, N. And then, so all sequences like that, but subject to the constraint that the number of changes is not too big. Okay, so A, T uh, not equal to A, T plus 1 is small or equal to some constant C. Okay, so this is the experts who are saying, I think you should play this action for some time and then you should switch to that action and so on. And we have all such experts. And the set of all such experts is sort of, if C is reasonably large, is going to be really huge. But this is going to allow us to compete with non-stationary. So that's the classical example, but there are others as well. Yeah. So here if you have just one perfectly informed expert, then this would be a conventional bandit problem, is that right? Then it could be a which bandit problem? If, so the usual banded problem you would recover if you had K experts and each of them are recommending, I think you should always play some fixed action and then you would recover the standard setting. If there's some perfect expert who's saying every time sort of the loss is, is the smallest, then you would be recovering essentially pushing the max inside the sum, which is 
uh, you would have the, this regret bound. Uh, this like weird regret is the sum t equals 1 to n. Uh, and now we have your loss. Oops, this is your loss. Lt at minus the minimum Lt i. Okay, so if you had a perfect expert, then, then you would get this. Uh, and we're going to see, okay, you could easily get this by having all experts, right? You have the set of experts who predict every possible action sequence, and there are lots of them. And we're going to see in the end that unfortunately our bound becomes vacuous in this case, which is what you would expect because this is just too hard. Okay, yeah. Uh, we're making no assumptions about that. It's just that the regret that we prove at the end of the day is with respect to the best expert in hindsight. So if there's one expert that's good in the first half and one in the second half, we don't, rest, you know, we don't track that. There are also ways to add tracking for things like this, but, but we're not going to do that here. Yeah, so this algorithm is going to do that. Okay. The algorithm that I show is going to, at first it's going to be kind of uncertain about which experts are good, and you'll see the form of the algorithm is going to be such that if an expert is predicting well, then you're more likely to, to go with their prediction, and if they're predicting badly, then you'll sort of discard their, okay. their thing. So this, this is what the algorithm will do, mm -hmm. uh, but here we're just saying what the objective is. Yeah, okay. All right, so we want to do, the, do an algorithm for this. And, and actually, what we're going to do is exactly uh, what we've seen before. We're going to do follow the regularized leader with a neg entropy potential. And here, the, the space of things we're viewing is like meta actions as the experts. All right, so we're going to do this thing on the space of experts instead of the space of actions. And, and the resulting algorithm is called ex 4 a very imaginative name. And what does it do? So this is coming back to your question. The algorithm is saying, well, I'm going to play I find a distribution over the experts. Okay, so in the previous uh, sessions, P was a distribution over actions, and here it's a distribution over the experts. And what is it? Well, it's this, this exponentially weighted distribution, and, and here inside we have a loss estimator for the losses that the, the expert recommended, for the actions that the expert recommended, right? So expert I recommended you play these AITs, that should be an S, that should that. They recommended you play this sequence of, of actions, and so you're going to estimate the losses that you think they would have got. It's a banded setting, so you don't necessarily get to see it, so we have to estimate them. But then nevertheless, if this expert I did badly, the sum of these losses is going to be big, and you're less likely to, to follow the advice of that expert. Okay, so then what the algorithm does once you have this distribution is you just sample an expert from the distribution, and that's... Uh, Okay, yeah, this ET, so you sample the, the expert, and then you just copy them. You play the, the thing that they recommend you do. All right, so each round you have a distribution over experts, you sample from it, and then you, you follow the advice um, of the expert you sampled from. Okay, so this is sort of the, the first part of, of what we need to do when we want to analyze these things. We need to choose on what space we're going to run our algorithm. And here we're running it on the space of experts. And then we need to come up with a way of, of estimating the losses. Right? And here we, we take an action, and then we get, a, get an observation. And, and so we can estimate the losses in exactly the same way, the importance weighted estimator. But instead of estimating the losses of a, an expert directly, right, what we could do, if we really just blindly followed this thing that we did for, for the normal bandits, we would have a different loss estimator we would estimate the loss of an expert, right? So what that would be, would be L hat ti uh, for an expert. This is a loss of an expert that you're estimating here. You might say, could be the indicator of ET, that's the expert that you sampled being I, and then LTI, you get to actually observe their loss when that happens, and then divided by this PT uh, of I, I guess. Oops. PT 
PMI. So this would be the normal importance weighted estimator that's estimating the loss for an expert. But this is actually throwing away a lot of information because when you play some action, you get information about all the experts who recommended that action, not just the one who you happen to agree with when you played. So if you use this estimator, the bound that you end up getting is actually just like what you would get if you did the, the normal analysis. You would get a bound that looks like square root uh, nm log m. Right, here we have m and we would like to have k and this is no good. And so the loss estimator that we should use should somehow make use of all the information we have. And that's, that's going to be this one, which is just saying, okay, I'm going to estimate the loss of the actions. It's like, did I play the action? Then times the loss. Now divided by the, the probability that I play the action, right, which is summing now over all the experts who recommended you play that action and then the probability that they play it, right? So this, this denominator here is the probability that you choose action A, right? And so this, this is an estimator that, that captures much better the information that you have available. Okay, so this is the algorithm, and actually the analysis is going to be really straightforward. Um, any, any questions on the algorithm? Uh, so the analysis, essentially what we do is we look at the, the bound that we proved yesterday and we plug in our stuff, right? So here we're using the negentropy potential, so we have the log m is the diameter of our set. That's what we've seen. We're playing on the space of experts, which has size m, so that's a log m. And then we have to bound the variance of this. And again, here we're summing over, over all the experts. And now we find that because we've used this, this slightly fancier estimator, that bound ends up being uh, of size k. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. But, but what this just means is that when we substitute these things in, we get a k here, we get an nk here, and now we tune this eta, and we get a bound that depends logarithmically on m, and, and the k is, is just appearing inside the square root, right? So here what we have is we have a much more powerful uh, class potentially of, of comparisons. We have this huge number potentially m comparisons and, uh, and the price we pay is just this log m. Okay. So the, the only thing I have to do is check that this calculation is really true. Unfortunately, that's not too hard. So why is that true? Chalk is very squeaky. All right, so what is the estimator that we have? So I'll just uh, write that again. So we have L hat T of A, so this is our estimator of the loss for an action, is the indicator of did we play it? T equals A. And then the loss of that action divided by the probability that we played the action, which is now this sum over all the experts. So this is the sum i equals 1 to m, uh, p, t, i, and then the indicator that that expert actually recommended it, i equals a. Okay, so that's just the, the definition of the loss estimator that we're using. And now we want to plug this into this, this expectation here and, and work that out. So what happens? Well, we have the expectation that T A, oh, actually that's not quite right, right? We have to sum over the, uh, over the experts. Okay, so we're summing over all the experts. A equals one to M, P T I. And now we have the the loss estimate for the action that that expert is, is recommended. So this is L hat T A T I squared. Okay, but this thing here, this thing just depends on the action that expert I recommended, right? So in particular, if we have a bunch of experts recommending the same action, then that's gonna be the same thing. So we're gonna sum, split this sum into what things did the experts recommend. So this is equal to the sum 
um, over A, over the actions. And now the sum over the experts, such that they predicted that action. I equals A. And now we have PTI and L hat T A T I squared, but this is just A. Okay, and I've I've lost the expectation. So we'll just put it there. Okay, so really we're just splitting this sum up, so we're considering the the experts who are recommending each action separately. But okay, what is this thing? This is now a sum over uh, PTI. This thing doesn't depend on I. And this here is the same thing as the, the sum over these probabilities. So we're going to get some nice cancellation, but there's a squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define Q T of A as being the probability that you play the action A. All right, so this is sum I. ATI equals A, PTI. Okay, so that's just the probability that you choose action A in round T. And so this thing, of course, is, uh, is equal to QTA. And so now we have this is equal to the expectation. And we have the sum over the actions. And now we have... Uh, here we're going to get QT A, and then the LT is going to give you a squared, so I think we get uh, L T A indicator function equals A divided by Q T A. Okay, so here we have the L squared. The indicator function squared is just the indicator function, so we don't need the, the square there. And here we've got a QTA because, well, we got a squared, a, a squared QTA in the denominator here, and we multiplied it by one here. Okay, and now we're in sort of familiar ground. What is this indicator function? Well, it's going to be one with probability QTA. And so since we're taking an expectation here, this thing just becomes one. And now we get this is equal to the expectation of the sum of the squared losses. And this is smaller or equal to k because we assumed that our losses were bounded in 0 and 1. Okay, so this is a, a sort of a routine calculation, but it gives us the right, right k. Questions on the calculation? Yeah. Let's see it come up in a second, I guess. The way that we can understand this is that if all experts are equally likely and the loss incurred is distributed over all choices, then we get this upper bound, is that right? Um, you get this upper bound no matter what. Uh, So it's going to be the hard case, I guess, is essentially um, the hard case is, what's it going to be? When you have a lot of experts, it's hard to construct these hard cases, actually. We'll see one shortly. It's going to be this non-stationary bandit case. Essentially, what you want to do is you want to have a sequence of bandits. And in each block, you're going to play a, for a little block, basically one bandit. And in each block, you have a bunch of experts who recommend to do different stuff. And, and that's going to give it to you. We'll see in a second that, that example, and, and that is going to roughly match this, this bound here. And that's the hard case. But actually, this bound is, is not very tight in lots of cases. So you can prove, for example, if the experts agree a lot, then you get a, a smaller bound here. Because essentially, the, the capacity of the space of experts is smaller if actually very often they're just saying the same thing. So there are cases where you can get much better bounds than this, but this is sort of the worst case thing. Any other questions? <coughs> uh, 
And I like this because it's, it's so easy. I mean, it's a really simple analysis once you've done the EXP3 analysis. Uh, but it really buys you quite a lot. And then this example of the, the non-stationary bandit is, is going to give an example, right? So here, we're back to the, the normal bandit setting. But we want to relax this assumption that the environment is essentially the same in every round. And, and so we have to be careful about this. Like, in the adversarial bandit, one of the, the selling points is that we make no assumptions about the data. Right? This, is, this is one of the really nice things about this adversarial online learning framework. You don't have to make statistical assumptions. And so you would think that adversarial bandits, like I presented yesterday, were already well suited for non-stationary environments. And that's not true. And, and the reason it's not true is because the notion of the regret doesn't measure the behavior that you would expect in to have in a non-stationary bandit. So, so let's give an example. So we have k equals 2. So we have just two actions. And I'm going to choose the sequences of losses, right? And I'm just going to say that, uh, so this is action 1, this is action 2, and then on the top uh, we'll have, have time going this way. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that action 1 is at first really a, a bad choice always lost one, right? So we have one, 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 and, and the other action is, is always a good choice. And this goes on for some time, and then it switches, right? So suddenly there's a transition, and now action one is, uh, is good. It has lost zero. So we have a bunch of zeros. And, and the other action has lots of losses, and so on. And we'll say that this, this split occurs at, at t equals n on 2, so halfway through. Right, so here we have this really distinct break where one arm is good at first and then it switches to being the other arm. But in the normal definition of the regret, what do we have? We have that the regret, the normal regret, is just Rn. Maybe we have some expectation. And then we have uh, t equals 1 to n, your losses, lt, at, minus the loss of, of some best expert. So here we have lt, a for some fixed a, and there should be a max at the front. Max a. Yeah. OK, this is the definition of the regret. And so what happens here? Let's say I choose a policy that just chooses randomly uniformly at random, one arm or the other. What is the regret going to be for that policy? Zero. It's going to be zero. Exactly, because uh, in this case, both of the arms, their cumulative loss, the sum of both of the arms is n on 2. Right? It doesn't matter which arm you choose, it's n on 2 over the whole period. And if you just average uniformly 50-50 here, you're just going to play, you know, your expected reward is a half in every round. Okay? So you can get zero regret with a ridiculous policy. And that doesn't feel right, right? So, so actually this regret can be extremely negative, right? You imagine an algorithm that plays, okay, maybe at the first beginning it explores both of them a little bit, but then it starts seeing that two is really good and it starts just playing two. And then it notices that two is not so good and it has an opportunity to switch back. And then you would get really negative regret, and, and that's what we would like. We would like an algorithm to get negative regret here. But the normal thing to do, rather than say, OK, I'm going to try and prove a negative regret bound, is to redefine the definition of regret. Okay? And, and essentially what's happening here is this definition of regret is not capturing the fact that you would like to be good against non-stationary environments. Right? This is clearly a very non-stationary environment. And so competing with just the best single action in hindsight doesn't seem like the best thing to do. Okay? And, and so we're not going to do that. We're going to redefine the regret to compare ourselves not to a single action, but a sequence of actions that has maybe less than C changes. Okay? So here we're saying we're not comparing ourselves to one action. We're taking the max over a big sequence. But we're saying that the number of times it changes can be at most C. Right? So in this example over here, we would have uh, a more meaningful regret bound if we had c equals 1, because there's one very clear change point here. You want to play one arm, and then you want to switch to the other. Okay, so here, if we, if we try and prove a regret bound for this, 
that should be meaningful for, for problems of this nature. And that's, that's what we're going to do. So this is the regret. And, and what's the algorithm going to do? Well, it's going to be this thing that I, I suggested at the beginning. We're going to do prediction with expert advice. And what are our experts? They're just the things in this, in this max here. Right? Here we have a, a huge number of sequences. And we're just going to say they're the experts. They're, they're saying what you should do. So in particular, there's going to be one expert who says that you should play arm um, two until halfway, and then arm um, one. And that's going to be the best expert in hindsight for this particular problem here. Okay? So what happens here? Well, we just plug in our bound that we proved for exp4, and, and that was this, uh, this, this square root, uh, I guess, 2k n log m. So the only thing we work, have to work out is how many experts do we have in this case, right? And, okay, that's going to be kind of a big set because here we have, like, the number of, this is like a big sequences, right? So how many sequences are there that have at most C changes? And, and well, we can be a little bit lazy about this. Okay, I'm not sure why this seems to have died. We can be a little bit lazy about this and say that, well, M can't really be much bigger than then n choose c times k to the power of c, right? So, so why is this? You have to choose the positions where the change points happen. That's basically n choose c. And then you have to choose which of the k possible actions does the expert recommend in each block. And that gives you the k to c. Okay, there's some, some laziness in this calculation because you can't choose the same action in two consecutive blocks, so it's an overestimate. Um, but it's, it's, it's more or less accurate. And we can approximate this n choose c, if we like, in a very lazy way. Well, it's definitely smaller than n to the power of c. That will be good enough for us. It's not quite tight, but, but that's fine. And so if we plug this in, what happens in our regret bound? Well, we get square root c now appearing outside the log, right? Here we have n k to the c, and the c comes down and you have square root c times n times k. So now we have a regret bound that works for these completely non-stationary bandits, uh, and the price that we pay is just the number of changes. And, and that actually makes quite a lot of sense. Uh, in a very easy case, we can e easily get a lower bound, in fact, that's quite close to that. How are we going to do that? So we know, actually, I haven't proven it for you, but we know that there's a lower bound for normal bandits that looks like square root n times k. Okay, you can't do better than square root n times k. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just split up my, my time again and into, into c blocks. Okay, so this is block 1, block 2, and so on up to block c. And then what I'm going to do is, well, within each of these blocks, there's a lower bound that says you suffer, right, how long is each block? The block is, is n divided by c in length. And we know that in each block there's a lower bound that says you can't do better than square root now n divided by c times k. So the regret in this block is square root nk divided by c. And there are c blocks. And so when we sum that up, you get c times this thing, and the c comes inside, and you get square root c n k. And this is essentially, up to logarithmic factors, the thing that matches the, the upper bound that we proved before. It's just here we have now this, this log n. Okay. I think you can get a lower bound that includes the log as well with more work. Okay. Any, any questions? All right, so now we're going to move on to something different. So this is the, the prediction with expert advice and, 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 and so on. And we're going to look at uh, some linear bandits. Okay, so this is more or less the same plan. We're going to say, have a new model, and then we have to estimate something, and we have to apply our algorithm, which is the normal thing. So here, here we're looking at the adversarial version of the linear banded problem that I introduced in, in, the, first, in the first lecture. And so here what happens is we have some action set that's a subset of Rd. Okay, this is your, your set of actions is now features. 
And, and the adversary chooses a sequence of loss vectors, so that's the normal thing. And we're just gonna have this normalizing assumption that the losses are not too big. So the, the reward or the loss that we're suffering is, is bounded in minus one, one. And, and again, in each round, you get to choose an action, but this time your loss is a, a linear function. It's an inner product, okay? And then you, you suffer the loss of the action you choose, and the regret is exactly the same thing as normal. So now we just have to, to use this extra linear structure to have a new estimator. Otherwise, everything is gonna be the same. Okay. And, and what is this new structure? Okay, so the, we have some examples. Um, this is sort of a nice setting because it covers a few things that we've seen already. So for example, if we have A as just the standard basis vectors, this is actually equivalent to the, the finite armed bandit. You get to choose a basis vector, and then you, you just get to observe essentially the, the, the coordinate of the loss in the direction that you played, right? You get to observe this, this LT and EI for some I is equal to LT what you get. So if you have the standard basis vectors, then this is just a normal bandit. Okay, so linear bandits are really a generalization of this. But you could also think of other action sets. So sort of there are fundamental ones mathematically like the, the LP balls, which are interesting to study. And then there are more practical ones where A is just like a big finite set. And that's the one that we're gonna talk about today. So A is usually like a set of feature vectors that are associated with users and, and the action or, or yeah, with, with, say, ads or movie recommendations or something like that. Okay, and you can deal with the changing action sets as well, which we also saw in the stochastic setting. Um, okay, so this is, the, this is the setting, and now we just have to look at what the algorithm does and, and see what happens. Okay, so the idea is we're going to play exponential weights with an egg entropy potential, and we're going to have the same bound that we've, we've seen in every example before, but now we just need an estimator for this L hat. So any, any proposals for how we estimate the losses in this case? Yeah. So in the previous, in the first lecture, we did least squares estimation for this linear bandit business. But it's a little bit trickier here, right? Because what do you get to observe? Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to choose some distribution. The algorithm is going to choose a distribution over actions. So like the alg is, is chooses some distribution, uh, pt. And then it samples an action from that distribution. And then you get to observe uh, the reward, which is the inner product between AT and LT. Now what we did in the, in the first lecture is we, we played a series of actions, right? And then we got the data matrix and we, we used our, our estimate. In that case was like this theta hat was the, the G inverse times S where this is the data matrix and this is like the sum of the covariates times the rewards. But here we only have one action. Right? We have to have an estimator of this loss based on one sample only. Because in, in the adversarial setting, the adversary can change the loss from every single round with, with, with no correlations at all. So here we need, we need it's a one-shot thing. So this, this matrix would not even be invertible if we did it like this, which is, is a little bit annoying. But it's close. How can we fix it? The task we have, we just have this data. We have a distribution, we have an action sampled from it, and then we have the loss. How do we estimate the whole LT vector in an unbiased way based on that? What's that? 
Um, can you be more concrete? <laughs> okay. It's actually really tricky. Um, we want to somehow combine this importance weighted estimation idea that we had for the adversarial bandits with the least squares estimation. And, and, and the idea is we're sampling this AT from PT. We don't, have a, we don't have a data matrix based on one thing, but we can look at the expected data matrix. So we can define, uh, I think I call it QT, so I'll go with that, um, as being the expected data matrix, right? So this is the, the sum over the actions that I could play, the probability that I play it, and then A, A transpose. Okay, this is the expected data matrix that you would get if you, if you did this many times. And this thing is going to be nice and invertible. And its expectation is going to be good. So what do we have? Now we can estimate our L hat by uh, going just QT inverse. And then the action that we played, AT, and then the inner product, the reward that we got, AT, LT. Okay, and if we do this, then things are going to work out. Okay, so, so we have this QT is the, the data matrix or the average one, and the L hat is now the least squares estimator. But what we've changed is we've replaced the actual data matrix, which just be AA transpose, with the expected one, which is this Q, and everything else is the same. Okay, and now we can calculate the expectation of this estimator. Well, what is it? So here we have the loss, and we're going to condition on the, the choice of distribution. So we're just looking at the time when we chose a distribution. And now we look at the expected value, and we're going to say, well, it's the sum over the, the actions we could have taken, the PT of A, the probability. And now when we substitute this in, well, we have the AA transpose here times the loss. And suddenly you see the, the sum of the, the first term here. Okay, this thing is all nice and linear, so we can pull the QT outside. And then this thing is QT. And, uh, and then you have QT, QT inverse is the identity. Okay, so the expectation of this single shot thing is the loss. It, it, it's, it's sort of incredible that based on just one sample, you can have a least squares estimator of, of this whole vector. Okay, of course, the variance is going to be reasonably large, um, and that's a little bit annoying, but nevertheless, we have this very simple way of estimating a loss in the least squares case. I think it's really neat. What if the action space is continuous? Well, if the action space is continuous, you can still do all of this. Uh, the QT is not going to be a sum anymore. It's going to be an integral. It's, 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 you replace this with literally the expectation operator and everything is still fine. And, and actually, we have algorithms that, that do this. Um, but, but for this case, the A is finite. But yes, the continuous case, you can, you can do as well. Any other questions? Clear? You look a bit perplexed. No? It's just beautiful, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is our estimator. Um, and it's unbiased, but we still have to look at what the, what the variance is like, right? This is the important thing. And so this is, the, this is the term that we care about. This is the term that appears in the regret. And so we just have to like, work out what this is. And it's actually a, a little bit of annoying calculation, but fortunately, it's pretty much all in equalities. So the first thing we do is we just substitute it in the definition. Right? So nothing really special has happened here. This is the, the loss of our action is the inner product with that action and the estimator. And I've just substituted in the definition of the estimator. So that's, that's fine. And now what we're saying, well, we had this assumption right, that the losses that we actually suffer are always bounded by 1. Right? So we assumed that the absolute value of AT and LT is smaller or equal to 1. 
And so that's what we're going to do here. We have C this, this ATLT squared term appears, and we're just going to pull that out. Okay, so that's, uh, that's also fine. That's the inequality. Oops. I don't know why this isn't working. Okay, so, so now we use this, uh, this trace rotation formula. So this is just the claim that, uh, which you can check yourself, but it's very useful. Uh, if A is a matrix, I guess here we'll call it R D by D, and X is a vector, then X transpose A X is equal to the trace of uh, A X X transpose, I guess is what I'm using. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's back. Excellent. Okay, so now we have some cancellation. So the trace is a nice linear operator. Everything is, is going to be good. So we can, we can pull it outside the expectation, the sum here. And now we've got this sum of the PTs and it's going to go over to the A's over there. That gives you a QT and you get QT inverse QT is the identity. So that's one cancellation. And now we just end up with this trace of, of this thing. And now we're going to take an expectation. And, and when we do that, well, it's exactly the same thing. We just have this is the thing that's random here when we're doing this expectation. And so we're summing over the PT of A. Suddenly we have A, A transpose here. That gives you another QT. You have D. Okay, so this, this variance term is just D. Really, really simple again. And, and we're going to see when you plug that into the bound that you get a really nice thing. Right, so our bound that we, that we have is Rn is smaller or equal to log k divided by eta. And now here we just have this, this d times n and eta over 2, I guess. So eta dn divided by 2. Okay, and the nice thing is that what we're really shooting for is a bound that doesn't depend really badly on k. And here, well, we have a log k but k isn't appearing on this side like it normally does in banded problems. And, and we've, we've converted the k into a d. This is what having features saves you, and, and this is equal to order square root d n log k. Okay, so again, we've just used the normal machinery. We've just calculated an estimator, and, and then we've, we've done the variance calculation. We just plug it into the same bound that we've got for every other thing, okay? And, and this gives us the right rate. And this is the bound that we want. It's, it's really nice. And, and in fact, it's slightly better than the bound that I showed you for the stochastic case. For the stochastic case, I showed you a bound uh, where the D was outside the square root. And I told you it was tight. Uh, for the stochastic case, I was claiming that the regret looked like this d square root n, basically, and there's some logs. And here I've just proven a bound for the adversarial case, which is making more or less weaker assumptions. It's better, <laughs> right? What's going on? How do we explain this apparent contradiction? So what doesn't appear in this bound that does appear in this bound? K, right? How big would K have to be for this bound to be about the same as this bound? It would have to be like, yeah, like uh, 2 to the D or, or something exponential in D, basically, right? Okay, so why do such bounds appear really naturally? Why should K be that large or... Or whatever, and, and the answer is, is, is simple actually. 
imagine that the action set is like a sphere. We're going to imagine now that we do have this continuous action set. Uh, so it's this set of the x's where the norm of the x uh, is smaller or equal to 1. All right, so this is just a, a sphere, but imagine it's in really high dimensions. And now we want to run this algorithm, but we want to run it over a, a finite number of k. But we want to make sure that we choose enough action so that basically we have one that's approximately optimal. Right, so we want to choose, choose some finite A prime to be finite in a subset of A. And A prime is going to have size k. And what we want is we want there to be some action that's a good approximator of the optimal thing in this set. Right? The optimal might lie in here, but we want an approximator that lies in here. Because remember, in the stochastic banded analysis, we didn't make any any assumptions on the size of the action set. And what happens? Well, we want, uh, basically, we want something that's good, that's close to optimal. And so we want there to exist some action A prime, such that this thing is small for any action A. Right? The action A could be the optimal one. We want to show that there is some A prime in this set, such that this is like, say, order square root n, something small enough that we don't care too much about it relative to the regret. And if you do this calculation for how many, how many things do you need in this a prime, you basically need that a prime, the size of it should be approximately equal to, um, well, it's like there's the accuracy that you care about, and then to the dimension, and the accuracy is 1 over square root n, so it's like square root n to the d. But the important thing is you have something exponential in D here. And if you plug that into this bound, which has literally just disappeared, then you have a D. And so this explains the, explains the contradiction. If you have a, a really continuous action set and you want to approximate it with a finite one, you need exponentially many actions to do that. And this is exactly what's happening here. Okay, but nevertheless, we have this, this case where if k is relatively small, then you have a good bound. And actually, in the stochastic setting, you can also prove such a bound if you have a small action set. It's just harder to do. Much harder, actually. So somehow this, this adversarial analysis seems to be almost easier than, uh, than the stochastic one, even though we made fewer assumptions. Okay, there's one little problem here. Um, and the main reason I'm highlighting this problem is because it gives me an opportunity to tell you about this optimal experimental design problem, which is really nice. Um, but the problem is here, we've, we've had this a little approximation thing here. And that approximation came from yesterday when we did the Taylor series approximation of the Bregman divergence for the relative entropy, right? This, this KL term we approximated by a Taylor series. And I just told you that that was okay. And it is okay. But it's only okay if these losses like are not really uh, negative. If the losses get really negative, then things can go wrong. And in all of the examples that I gave you so far, the losses are just positive. Right? The importance weighted estimator is, is generally positive uh, because you just have the loss divided by some probability and the loss is positive, so everything is positive. But here, when you do this, this least squares estimator, these L hats, you have the inverted matrix, and suddenly there's no particular reason why the estimated L hat should be positive. And in fact, it can be negative. And if this condition is not violated, then this approximation, if this condition is violated, rather, then, then this approximation can be, can be quite bad. So this isn't yet a proof. We have to make a, a little modification. And the modification we have to make should guarantee that this, this holds. We want the loss not to be too big. So what's another reason for why this occurs? If you think about what the algorithm is doing, the algorithm is doing this exponential weight stuff. And the exponential function looks kind of different depending on whether you feed positive things in or negative things, right? So the, the PT of A is equal to uh, the exponential minus the eta. S equals 1 to t minus 1, and then we have L hat S of A, okay, divided by uh, the sum of the actions. 
same thing. Okay. So this is what the algorithm is doing. So it sort of seems to make sense. If the, if the losses are big, then the algorithm plays with low probability and otherwise somewhat higher probability. But the exponential function, uh, if you plot it, looks like this, right? Then it just gets big really, really quickly. This is, this is like E. And, and so what happens if you're feeding in negative losses, then you're looking at this regime of the exponential function, where everything is relatively flat, the gradients are small, the things, everything is well behaved. But if you start getting losses that are actually really quite negative, then this term here can get quite positive. And suddenly you're in a realm of the exponential function where it's totally wild. The gradients are huge, the thing is really blowing up. And then this algorithm actually becomes unstable. Okay? And, and the way to control that is to ensure that you're like never playing too far away from this region here. And that's what this condition is saying you should do. Okay? You should always have your losses. They, they can be a little bit negative, but they can't be too negative. Otherwise things get unstable. And so we need to modify the algorithm a little bit so that this, this doesn't happen. Okay. And there's a nice little trick for this, which is actually a pretty common thing to add and helps in other ways as well because it encourages sort of a more stable algorithm. We had this question yesterday about what happens to the variance of these algorithms if they're a grad. It can be very large. But if you add a little bit of exploration, then it actually can be much smaller. And that's what we're going to do here. So FTRL recommends that you play some distribution PT, but we're not going to do that. We're going to mess with the algorithm a little bit. What we do is we play an average, a mixture of, of PT. So we're going to play P tilde T, and we're going to play mostly PT. This gamma is going to be relatively small. So with essentially high probability, we're playing what, what the algorithm suggests. But then we add a little bit of exploration. So this pi is some distribution that you choose in advance. It's a distribution of the actions. And you always play that with a little bit of probability. And the idea is this, this extra probability is going to, to give you enough exploration to guarantee that the losses are never like really too big. It's not even that they're too positive or too negative. They're just going to be relatively small. And, and so what we have to do is we have to choose this exploration distribution and then see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to show you the calculation for, uh, for what these things are. So the first thing that happens is the QT now, this is the, the average data matrix based on the distribution that we actually play, which is P tilde. Okay, so here we just have P tilde here. And this is, uh, this is going to be bigger than just gamma Q pi here. So basically we're going to drop a whole lot of terms. Uh, by greater than here, I just mean that... Uh, this A, I'm not very used to writing this symbol, A is, is, is sort of bigger than B as matrices if A minus B is positive definite. Okay. And, and here what we're doing is, well, we, the QT is really the sum of two positive definite matrices, and we're just dropping one of them. And, and what we're left with is just the distribution from our exploration, which is this gamma times, times a new data matrix. And now we want to bound the, the magnitude of our loss. Okay, well, we just start plugging things in. We, we just plug in the definition of the, the loss that we've estimated and, and see what happens. Okay? And, and the first step we're going to do is, I guess, pull out this ATLT. We know that's less than one. We've assumed that's less than one, so we can pull that out. And then, okay, we split this matrix along the uh, inner product, right? So we have uh, an inner product. <laughs> Basically, what I have is I have A transpose QT inverse AT, I guess. Yep. Okay, but we can rewrite this thing as being uh, the absolute value of A uh, QT inverse AT. These, these matrices are positive definite. They're going to be invertible. They have just all the nice structure that you need for the square root to exist. So this is equal to uh, A Q 
qt half, qt minus 1 half, at. And, uh, and now we can pull one of these over to the other side. These matrices are uh, self-adjoint. They're, uh, they're equal to their transpose. They're symmetric. So, so then we have the thing that we want. Minus 1 half. And now we're going to apply Cauchy-Schwarz, right? So we, we, we plug in our, our beloved Cauchy-Schwarz, and, and what we end up getting is, is just the norm, but they're weighted by these, these Q matrices for each. And now what I'm going to claim is, a, is this super nice result, which is that there exists a, a distribution pi such that these things are both bounded by D. And this is like incredibly non-obvious, and, and it's a really nice theorem by Kiefer Wolfowitz from the 60s, where they make some very nice connections between different optimization problems. So, so there are these two optimization problems. So G of pi here is the thing that we sort of want to optimize. We want to find a distribution pi where the, the weighted norm is, is small for all actions. Okay, so we want to minimize we want to find a distribution G pi that minimizes the right-hand side there, which looks like a really kind of hopeless optimization problem. It's like, how do you do this? The action set might be quite big, and you have this weird max, and, and you want to minimize it. It's, it's, it's really nasty. Like, it's not, not a good problem at all, apparently. But it turns out that it's actually equivalent to maximizing this log determinant problem. And that's like a volume thing, actually, right? If you have a a matrix, a positive definite matrix Q pi, the determinant is the volume of, uh, it's the volume form of that. Like if you have a, 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 an ellipse essentially of determined by Q pi, then this is a volume thing. And Kiefer Wolfowitz proved that these things are equivalent. And furthermore, that if, if A actually spans the uh, RD, okay, if you have enough actions to span RD, then the optimizer is actually exactly equal to D. Like, it's exact. We, we know what the optimal value of this optimization problem is. It's exactly D. It's really incredible. Um, and the proof is, is not hard. I won't show it to you, but it's sort of you just do the stuff you normally do when you, differ, you prove things are minimum. Like, you take differentials, and then you just set them equal to zero, and then it just all falls out. Uh, so it's incredibly nice um, and also pretty surprising. And the last point is that the support of this pi is, is not too big. So that's not very useful for us here, but it's, it's sort of interesting. And it has a very nice geometric interpretation, um, which is related to this problem of finding a minimum volume ellipsoid. Uh, and this, this is the problem. So here I've plotted the set of points. These are, the, these are your action sets. And the data matrix that you get when you choose a distribution pi, that determines an ellipsoid, which I'll write. You have the ellipsoid uh, uh, here. It's the set of x in ID such that this, this norm x squared with respect to q uh, pi inverse is smaller or equal to d. So this is the equation for an ellipsoid, if you have some positive definite matrix here. And, and this ellipsoid here, I've plotted in this particular case for the optimum. And what it is, is it's the, the smallest ellipsoid that contains your points. Okay, so this is, it's, and it has to be a central ellipsoid. So it's centered at zero, and it contains these points. And that's what this pi is. It's the distribution over the action such that the resulting data matrix is this thing. And the distribution itself is supported on just the points that are on the boundary of the ellipsoid here. So in this case, the, the pi would be 0 for all but those three points. And, and on those three points, it's going to be something such that this is true. Yeah, and this is, uh, I think this is a very nice result. It's also related, if you know some convex analysis, it's basically uh, another version of John's theorem, if you like. But okay.
So this is Kiefer Wolfowitz, and we're going to, well, we just use the fact that this distribution exists to, to add the exploration to our algorithm. And essentially what you should think of this algorithm as doing is it's choosing the, the, the points that you should play to minimize the variance if you did a least squares estimation, right? So if you're normally just doing a least squares estimation problem, and this is why it's called experimental design, let's say you get to choose a bunch of covariates. So you have some, some action set, A, which is a finite subset of RD, and you get to choose a bunch of covariates, and then you get to, so you choose you choose uh, uh, the A1 up to some AN. There's no real reward here. You have a different objective, but you get to choose a sequence of covariates. And then you get to see a sequence of signals. So we have X1 up to XN. And XT is, uh, well, it's, it's going to be equal to the inner product of AT, some parameter theta that you don't know, plus eta T noise. Okay, so this is like the linear banded setting that we saw on the first day, but we don't really care about the regret. What we care about here is the, the estimator, the variance of the estimator. So this is the normal case. So we have IG is the data matrix, uh, AT, AT transpose, and we have our least squares estimator is theta hat, is this G inverse onto N. ATXT, I guess. XT, so that's your least squares estimator. And now you can say, what is the variance of this guy? Okay, and the variance is going to be um, the variance in a particular direction. Okay, so the variance uh, of uh, a theta hat, if you work out what this is, well, it's just equal to the norm of A weighted by the inverse data matrix. This is basically the calculation that we did in the first lecture. And, and so now what the, what the experimental design problem is saying is, well, roughly speaking, how do I choose these A's to make this as small as possible. All right now, that, that in itself is a quite a hard integer programming problem because you have to like choose exact numbers. But what we can just say is instead, we're going to find, find the optimal design. So this is the distribution. This is pi, which is a function from your action set to zero, 1, and it's a probability distribution. And now we're going to play actions. So we're going to play uh, A in A exactly. OK, now we have a little rounding problem, so I'll just take a ceiling, pi of A in times. Right, so we've we're saying essentially, I want to play according to this distribution pi, but I have to do a little bit of rounding to, to make things match up. And, and what happens if I do this? Well, really, I just have now the pi of a times n in this g here. So g basically is approximately equal to, if we ignore the rounding, the sum over the actions, pi of a, and then we have n out the front. A, A transpose, so this is N Q pi, this distribution here, so this is the G, what is G inverse now? G inverse is going to be uh, 1 over N Q pi inverse, and now when we substitute that into this bound, we get that this is uh, basically equal to, except for this rounding business, uh, to the norm of A Q pi inverse squared divided by N. And this is smaller or equal to D divided by N. 
by the Kiefer Wolfowitz theorem. So this, this theorem is, is telling you how you should choose your covariates if you have a choice and you want to learn a least squares estimator. This theorem tells you how to do that in, a, in essentially an optimal way. Okay, so this is a, a thing from experimental design. It's like where you want to design your experiment to maximize the amount of information that you get. Right? And so it's not very surprising that here when we want to add this exploration to our algorithm, we want to add exploration that explores in kind of an optimal way. And that's exactly what this g-optimal thing is doing. I think it's really nice and uh, even better is you can actually relatively efficiently compute this thing. So you can compute an approximate uh, d-optimal design or g-optimal design using, um, using Frank Wolf and it works up to hundreds of dimensions and and I think millions of points nowadays. Really nice. Any, any questions on, uh, on that? Yeah. Uh, so, so you, you basically, if you're a bit lost, so you basically are uh, computing P given that you want to minimize the variance. So you already have a way to compute P in order to minimize the, this variance. Yeah. This is what you call exploration. Yes. Because so somehow use more exploration to be like some randomization element, or just I, I, I don't know. Like I just don't see how it's real. So, well, why, at least, why at least you're calling it exploration if you're just computing something that you already want to minimize variance? Like how is it called? So I guess I'm calling it exploration. So first of all, this 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 pi is a distribution. Okay. It's a distribution over the actions. Uh, such that if you sample the actions from that distribution and then you do least squares estimation, you minimize the variance of the, the thing. So in that sense, it's like, what is exploration? You want to understand what the real thing is. Okay. And we have an estimator in mind, this, this theta hat, and if we, if we commit to using this estimator, its quality is roughly measured by the variance. Right? If the variance is really low, then we have a good idea of what, what's going on. And if it's high, we don't. So how, how should we choose to explore when we, we choose these actions? Well, we should choose them to make the variance relatively small. Okay. And this, this thing is, is doing exactly that. Okay. It's just terminology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, is there some connection there? I'm not sure it's exactly the same. Um, I mean, here we are doing a variance reduction, so in that sense it's the same thing. We, we are sacrificing, not exactly bias in this case, but we're not doing what the algorithm tells us to do because the thing that it tells us to do would result in a high variance estimator. But yeah, I'm not sure if it's easy to make a parallel exactly, but it's, it's maybe something to think about. All right, um, and so if we just plug this into our bandit, then once you fix all these constants, um, now you face this difficulty, right? We're not playing anymore what the algorithm says we should. And for that, because you're doing this random exploration like all of the time with some probability, uh, you pay a price for that, right? Gamma is like the probability that you explore. And when you explore, your regret could be, could be big because you're just choosing one of these actions that looks kind of like it was good for exploring but not necessarily good for regret. And so you pay this n gamma price here. Uh, but fortunately, we're allowed to choose gamma relatively small. So the calculation that we did to check that the losses weren't getting too negative required this condition here. Okay, so we're just going to choose gamma to be exactly equal to eta times d. And then we get two of them here, two eta in D here, and if you fix all of the constants, you do all the approximations properly, then what you end up with is, is these, these constants here. But the main point is we have basically the bound that we wanted, but actually it's a real bound now. Uh, so this, this added exploration is really crucial for this purpose. And at the same time, it, it, it makes the algorithm more robust. So yeah, you, can, you can really see the improvement. Okay. And that's linear bandits. Right, so again, it's the same thing. It's just the same old algorithm that we've gotten used to. New estimator, 
slightly new analysis, and then here we had to add a little bit of forced exploration. But otherwise, it's, it's all the same stuff. All right. Any, any questions on this one? So the problems I want to show you next is, is a really nice one. It's this, this optimal path routing problem. So this is an online problem. We have a map. And uh, OK, this is the picture from the book. I'm from Australia. My, my co-author is from Hungary. So like you have to get from Budapest to Sydney. Right? That's your objective. It's a really long way, I can tell you. Like 12 hours, now the eight hours, it's really terrible. Um, but this is the goal. And the game that we're going to play is you have to do this a lot. I go back to Australia. Well, not as often as I should, but, but anyways. And never from Budapest, but as may be. So the problem is I have to choose a path, right? So I buy my plane ticket, and then I, I take my flight, and I get to see how long it took. Okay? And the model we're going to assume is when I take a flight, I get to learn how long that flight was. And I don't get to observe how long other flights were. All right, so if I, if I decide to go Budapest, Frankfurt, Singapore, Sydney, then I observe that this was one hour, this was 12 hours, and this is eight hours. Okay, but I don't get to observe that, that Beijing, Abu Dhabi would have been seven hours. Okay, so this, this is a feedback that we don't actually call banded feedback. We call semi-banded feedback. And the reason for that is because you get a little bit more information. Right? Here, we don't just get to observe the sum, the total time that it took. We get to view the, the time it took along each path in the graph. Okay, so again, this is just a sequential game. Each round, I, I choose which path I want to take, and the adversary gets to choose the, the lengths of all of these things. Okay, and I want to do as well as the best single path in hindsight. Okay, so this is, this is the semi banded problem. And uh, it has a really, really nice and sort of straightforward solution. And here's the formalization. OK, so we're going to say we have d edges in the graph. And, and a path is just like some set of those edges. Not just any set, but like a set that actually forms a path through this graph. And our action space is, is the set of paths. And we're going to represent these paths as, uh, as one or zero vectors, right? So the actions are, is some big subset of, of 0, 1 to the d. And if the coordinate is equal to 1, that just means we played, we moved along that path. All right, so if you have a really simple graph, uh, this is your start goal, which we have. Uh, and then there are maybe two nodes, I don't know. Maybe things are directed. So this is our start, and this is our goal. So here there are just two paths, and d is equal to 4. D is equal to, to 4, and A is, uh, there are just two paths, and so we're going to label our paths. This is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and A is going to be 1, which is uh, a 1, a 1, and two zeros, and the other is going to be 0, 0, and two ones. Right, so these are just uh, like like m hot vectors where where the ones are indicating which paths you're taking. Okay, so this is the the set of actions that we're assuming, which obviously, if you have a big graph, could be a really big set of actions. Here we have a sort of unusual case where the action set is actually smaller than d, but if you imagine you have a much bigger graph, the action set is usually much larger than d. The set of paths is usually much bigger than the the set of edges. Okay? And we're going to assume that uh, the loss is the length of the whole path. Right? I, I suffer in a plane for 24 hours. That's my loss is 24. And, uh, and that's this thing here. And it's, we can just write it as an inner product. Right? This is the power of this linear structure. It actually appears a lot. And here, because the actions are these one hot vectors, this just selects out the paths that you go. And that's the loss that you suffer. So it's a linear loss, as we, we used to. And just to, to normalize things nicely, we're going to assume the losses are between 0 and 1. But of course, you can scale that up to 0 and 15 if you're doing these silly flights. OK, so this is just the formalization of this problem. OK, and, and the, the set A is given to you. All right, so there are sort of two cases that people studied, as I mentioned. There's the banded feedback, and there's the semi-banded feedback. So in the banded feedback, all you get to observe is the length of the whole path. 
but in the semi-banded feedback that we're going to be talking about today, you actually get to observe just the length of each path that you actually took. Right? So if, this, if you didn't take it, then the ATI is equal to zero, and then you just get zero. It doesn't really provide you any information. Uh, but if you did take it, then you actually get to observe the loss. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the problem. So I'm going to show you another application of this, this framework uh, to show that actually this semi-banded thing is, is kind of a flexible and nice framework. And this is just a simple ranking problem. There are more complicated ranking problems as well. Um, so in ranking, the problem that you have is you have like a a board that you're showing to your to some users, so like maybe your Netflix, and and in Netflix, I don't know what it looks like. It's like they have some window, and then they show you a bunch of movies, basically. Right? You get to to choose which movies the user gets to click on. Ranking is a really complicated problem, actually, and this is a very simplified version of that. Uh, and ranking is made complicated by lots of things. So, so ranking is hard for one reason, because like if you show users things at the top, they're more likely to look at those than things later on, right? And and usually you have like an enormous number of things, and it's very hard to understand like what makes a user click on one thing rather than another. But here we're just going to go with a simplified model. We're going to say that we have uh, m positions that we can show. So in this case, m is nine can show M movies to our user, and uh, there are D, D products to recommend, okay? And, and the loss that we suffer is like, okay, of the things that we showed, what did the user interact with? Right? We, want, we want to maximize these interactions, and so we're going to say the loss is zero if they, they did click on it or do whatever they're supposed to do with these things, buy it or, or whatever, and one otherwise. And now the set of actions is like, well, we can show m things. And the actions are just like these one hot vectors again, or the m hot vectors, saying a one is in a coordinate if you actually showed that thing to the user. So our action is the set of things where the, the L1 norm is equal to, to m. Right? There's zero one vectors where you have m things turned on. Okay, and this is like a, a little model for a ranking problem. And here, what do you get to observe? Well, you get to observe uh, the clicks. Did they, did they interact with the things that you showed? But it really is like a bandit. You have to do exploration because you don't get to observe if they would have clicked on something that you didn't show. So you have to do a little bit of exploration. So both of these problems can be formalized in this, uh, this uh, online linear semi-bandit setting. And so this is the general problem. So the general problem is you, you're given some set of actions which we assume are zero, one vectors, and the, the L1 norm is bounded by M, so they're, they are at most M hot vectors. But you're given some set, so the A could be sets of paths, it could be rankings, it could be all kinds of things, or you can add, have rankings, but you can add constraints so that you can't show two movies together or something like that. And then the loss that you suffer is just the inner product, like we've seen, and, and we particularly care about this bandit feedback case. Okay. And the regret is exactly the same thing as, the, as we've looked at in every other case. It's just the difference between the loss that we suffer and the loss that you would suffer if you did the best thing in hindsight. Okay, and this is the, this is the combinatorial semi-bandit. And, and we're going to uh, look at one algorithm for this, this problem. Any, any questions on the setup? Exactly, the length of the longest path. Exactly, that's right. And we'll see that M is going to appear in the bound that we prove. Yeah. Any other comments? All right. So it's going to come as probably no surprise that we're just going to do more or less the same thing that we've done before. Um, but there's a little bit of a trick here. And the trick is that we're not going to play uh, follow the regularized leader on the set of actions. We're actually going to play it on the convex hull of the action set. And, and, 
that's going to end up leading to a better bound. And we'll sort of see why shortly. So what is the algorithm doing? I hope I wrote it down. OK. I wrote down the loss estimates. So yeah, so we're going to play FTRL with neg entropy, uh, but on the convex hull of A. So what is the convex hull? It's just like the smallest set that makes something convex. So if you have some set of points just in R2, this is not a convex set, right? Because if I take an average of some points, it's not convex. The convex hull is this thing. Okay, so that's the convex hull. And our algorithm, we're going to apply follow the regularized leader on the convex hull of the action set. So the action set here is, is this A, which is this sort of like high dimensional set of points. We're going to take the convex hull, which gives us a thing called a polytope. And that's where, where the, the FTRL is going to play. Okay. And, and then what we're going to do, well, you can't actually play a point inside a convex hull, right? You have to make a recommendation to your user. And so what we're going to do is the, the learning algorithm is saying, well, I want you to play this point here. That's the recommendation. And then you have to find a distribution over the corners that averages to this point here. And the algorithm is going to play that distribution. Right? So that's this, this PT. So the algorithm is, is, is recommending that you play XT. It doesn't understand that you're living in this, this set where you have actions. It thinks you're playing in the convex hull, which you can't. So this is this standard convexification idea. We're going to play probability distributions with an average equal to the thing that follow the regularized leader recommends. Okay, so this is, this is the idea. And then we need a loss estimator. And here we have this extra information, right? We have the information of what is the loss in each coordinate. And so we're going to estimate our loss by the same importance weighted thing. So this, this ATI is basically like the indicator function of did we take path i, right? That's just the definition of the setup. So ATI equals 1 if and only if you play path i. You like flew on i. Right? Okay, and otherwise it's equal to 0. And what we're saying is, well, the loss is just going to be the, the L hat i is going to be the loss along that path if we actually did get to observe it. And then did we actually get to observe it? And then divided by xti, which is the probability that you get to observe it. Right? So xti, this thing here, you can think of as the probability that you take path so this really is just our importance weighted estimator again, but now because we have the extra information, we get to observe the loss in every coordinate. We don't have to do any more this, uh, um, this least squares estimator, but we can just estimate it in the coordinates independently. And this is going to buy us something, okay. So that's the loss estimator. I should just write down what the algorithm is doing, this xt, because we for some reason didn't write that. So I said that the algorithm is playing follow the regularized leader with neg entropy on the convex hull of A. So I'm just going to let K be equal to the convex hull of A. Okay. And what the algorithm is doing, the algorithm is choosing xt plus 1 to be the argmin x in this set k. And now we're doing follow the regularized leader. So we have uh, a learning rate and then the sum of our losses. Okay, or the estimated losses. So here we have x and l hat s. And then we have a regularizer. Plus f of x. Okay. So before I was able to write this down as an exponential weights distribution. And the only reason I was able to do that was because we were playing on the simplex. And now we're not playing on the simplex. And when you're not playing on the simplex, this optimization problem, you can't, 
you can't just solve in closed form to give you the exponential weights thing. So, so we just have to leave it in this form for now, but that's what the algorithm is doing. Well, why don't we play on the simplex? You could. You could play on the simplex. And, and what happens, so then what you're doing is you're playing on the set of actions. You, you lift to this, this big set of actions and you play exponential weights on that. It turns out that that gives you a slightly worse bound. And, and to give you some little bit of intuition about that, what does the regret bound look like when we do this neg entropy stuff? What you end up getting is you get log uh, of, of, the, of the dimension of the thing that you're playing on divided by the learning rate. And then we have the plus the, the sum of these, these dual norm things squared uh, in expectation. Right, so this is what we have as our bound. Now, if th this thing is basically the same no matter how you play. If you lift to the space of actions, this is, this is going to stay the same. But this term here, this d, is replaced not by d, uh, which is the dimension of the convex hull of A. That dimension is d. But if you look at the space of all actions, you would have not d, but you would have log of the size of A here instead. And A is usually really, really, really big in these games. And so this is, this is why this causes the problem. It's a really good question. OK, so we're not going to do that, um, although it would make the analysis truly easy. But now, nevertheless, all we have to do is just like plug this into our bound. Right, so this is now the original bound that I had. We can't have the log k particularly because now we're not actually playing on the simplex anymore exactly. And still we have the, the difference in the potentials and then the sum of the, the dual norm stuff appearing there. And we have to bound each of these two terms. So let's, uh, okay, I probably shouldn't have done that. Let's just write out what that thing is again. So we have L hat. Ti is equal to Ati uh, Lti divided by uh, Xti. Okay, so let's do the, the second term first. Well, it's actually exactly the same calculation that we're really used to. Uh, we care about the expectation sum i equals 1 to d, x t i, and then the l hat i squared. This is the thing that we're trying to bound. And well, we do our usual business. We substitute in this definition. This is the expectation. Uh, sum i equals 1 to d. OK, so a t i is either 0 or 1. So when we square it, it's just equal to a t i. It's an indicator function. And so we have a t i l t i squared divided by x t i. But here the expectation of, of, uh, of a t i is equal to x t i. So this is equal to the expectation sum i equals 1 to d l t i squared, and this here is just smaller or equal to d, because we've assumed that our losses are bounded in 0 and 1. So this is again the, the, the familiar calculation that we've done a lot. And so that gives us the, the second term. And now we just need to do the first term. And, and when we were working on the simplex, the first term just gave you this log k really easily, and now it, it doesn't. Now we have to do a little bit more. So what we care about is bounding uh, f of, uh, what am I calling it, x. f of x, or a, minus f of x1. OK, but what is this f? The f I'll just write as the, the neg entropy potential. So f of, of a is the sum a i log a i minus a i. 
And here, these x's and a's, each, each coordinate of the x and a's is, is somewhere thing between 0 and 1. Okay? And, and so this thing is actually going to be smaller or equal to 0, um, no matter what the a's are. You just do a little calculation, and this is smaller or equal to 0. So the only term we really have to care about is this minus f of x1. Okay, so now we can just write this out. So this is equal to sum i equals 1 to d uh, xi minus sum i, let's make it a plus fact, and have xi log 1 divided by xi. Okay, so this is just writing out the definition of the neg entropy. Now this term here, this is the sum of the action that we played, and by our assumption on the action set, this thing is smaller or equal to m. So this is smaller or equal to m plus the sum i equals 1 to d xi log 1 on xi. Okay. So this thing looks very much like an entropy. Uh, the only thing that's going wrong is the, the sum of the xi's is equal to m, not actually 1. Uh, so we're going to bring an m out the front, divide it by m here, and then we're going to do the same thing inside the log. Uh, what do I want? m divided by m. Okay. And this term here, this sum, what do we have? We have the sum i equals 1 to d, xi divided by m, log 1 on xi divided by m, and the other m I'm going to pull out. So this is plus sum 1 to m. log uh, 1 on m. Okay, so this thing is now a, prob a legit probability distribution, and we're calculating the entropy of a probability distribution with d things. And so, if you remember your information theory, this term is smaller or equal to log d. And this term here, well, now we just have a constant here, and we're summing over the xi's, which equals, uh, or the xi over m, which is equal to 1. And so this is just uh, plus log 1 over m, and then we bring it inside here, and we get log d divided by m. Okay, so this is a bound on our potential. That we end up getting is just m from this term, and then 1 plus uh, m here, and then the log d over there. So log d divided by m. And that's the second part. And then we optimize the eta. So this gives us our expression, I hope. Good. So this is now just substituting in both of these calculations that we do. And if we optimize the eta, this is what you end up getting. Okay? And we actually know that this bound is optimal, or, or more or less optimal. Whereas if we, if we did the suggestion of playing outside, then I think what happens is the m creeps out here, if you play on the, on the big set. So it's just a little bit worse. Um, right. So we have just five minutes left. So the only problem with this algorithm uh, is that it has some computational challenges, right? So to, to implement this algorithm, what is the optimization problem you have to solve? Well, there are two. You have to solve the, the mirror, dis uh, the, the follow the regularized leader calculation, okay? And that's a convex problem, so that's a priori hopeful. And then you also have to find the, the PT such that, that this holds. <laughs> the average. That's a linear problem, so that's also a priori hopeful. But the problem here is both of these problems are over a, a really nasty set. This set A 
is huge. It's like this, this convex hull is this, this giant polytope. And in general, this convex optimization stuff is not going to work well if the, the size of the input is potentially even exponential, right? Even to describe what this polytope looks like, I might need exponentially many parameters to tell you that. And if that's the situation that you're in, then even your fancy convex optimization problem algorithms uh, are not going to help you out. And, and there's sort of a reason for this. This combinatorial optimization is just hard. Right, like we could in, encode uh, shortest path problems, like uh, uh, traveling salesman problems and things like this. And you just can't solve those problems efficiently. So we, we should not expect to have an efficient algorithm for this problem. But there is a case when we can hope. Um, and the, the, it comes from looking at the regret, right? So let's imagine that we have an algorithm that has small regret. That's what we're trying to derive anyway. Okay, so then the regret is, is looking like this. And so if we have an algorithm with small regret, what that essentially means is I could, and it's efficient, if we have an efficient algorithm with small regret, I can just run that algorithm and look at the average action that it produced, and the average action that it produced should be close to optimal. And what that means is that I can solve by running my algorithm approximately equations of this form. Right, I, I should at least be able to solve this the linear optimization problem on your action set A. Because if I, if I have an efficient algorithm for this problem, then it, can, it, it itself is going to approximately solve this problem. And so it seems reasonable in this search for an efficient algorithm, we can restrict ourselves to cases where this holds. So we're going to assume that we can just solve this problem and then ask, what to do algorithmically. And there's a very nice idea um, which says don't do follow the regularized leader. Do a thing called follow the perturbed leader. And, and follow the perturbed leader replaces the regularization with randomization. And, and what it does is it says, okay, we're going to play follow the leader. Right? Follow the leader is just doing the thing that's best in hindsight. But then we add a little bit of noise to the losses. We choose a, a, a good choice of this ZT randomized dis distribution and we perturb our losses by that amount and then we do follow the leader on the perturbed thing. This is called follow the perturbed leader and the perturbations give you, it turns out, enough exploration that this, this is a good thing. Okay? And this algorithm is not quite as good as, as the, the follow the regularized leader for this particular problem or at least we don't know how to make it that good. We don't know how to choose the ZT so that the regret is quite as good. But I think we can do, yeah, so we can prove a bound where the M just comes outside the square root, but we've replaced this potentially really hard convex optimization problem with a linear optimization problem. And this is something that we can hope. And, and the nice thing is, okay, I mean, we, we can't use follow the regularized leader anymore, but the analysis of this algorithm is, is it's too technical to show here, and I don't have near, anywhere near enough time, but, but the proof is actually very nice, and the main idea is to say, well, what is this algorithm? It's actually follow the regularized leader in expectation with some potential. And then you just do all the normal stuff. All you have to do is work out what potential is, is this equivalent to an expectation, and then you do the normal follow the regularized leader bound. And that, that gives you the answer. So this is a, a really nice framework. And there are lots of algorithms that fit into this. So you sort of looked at Thompson sampling and, and things like this in some experiments. And, and these are all essentially versions of this follow the perturbed leader idea. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Yeah? Was he at the structure So um, there's a few differences. I would say it's more similar to Thompson sampling. So this, this addition here, this ZT is a random thing. So it's sometimes positive, sometimes it's negative. Uh, so it's not always saying you should be optimistic about stuff. Sometimes it actually looks bad. Whereas Thompson sampling is, is sampling from a, a posterior. And so it's sort of more connected, I think, to Thompson sampling than anything else. But, but it is generally this idea that if you just do follow the, follow the leader, you don't explore enough. And by adding this randomization, you encourage exploration. And that, that's the thing that works out. Yeah, any other questions? Or I just recap.
All right. So I just want to say, like, I mean, we wrote this whole book, and uh, and it turns out that in six hours you can't present a 600-page book. So there's some still some more stuff for you to be excited about. Um, so we talked a little bit actually about handling these non-stationary environments today, um, but we didn't talk at all about delays, right? Like in, in practical problems, you show your user something and then they go away, and then a, a week later they come back and they buy, buy the thing or not. And, and that's a really hard problem to deal with because you run into all kinds of trouble that appears in reinforcement learning like credit assignment, right? If the user comes back a week later, how do you decide which intervention caused them to buy the product? And, and so delays is a, is a big issue, and there's a bunch of stuff on that. And then there's lots of other structure we didn't talk about. So you can talk about, we did a lot of stuff on linear bandits, where the losses are linear, but what if they're convex? And that turns out to be a really rich, interesting problem that's still not fully understood. Uh, you can talk about infinite action spaces. You can talk about like bandits on whole graphs. Uh, you can kernelize everything. Um, and, and then there's lots of other settings. So the only setting that I've talked about really is this regret minimization setting, where you care about the cumulative reward that you get over a bunch of rounds. But there's also this, this pure exploration setting where what you care about is just identifying the best action. You don't care about the price that you pay, um, which is relevant, for example, if you're doing clinical trials and you, you know, you, you're doing it on mice. So you don't care about the mice, but you care about the thing that you recommend at the end. And there you, there you have the pure exploration problem. Um, then there are other settings altogether, like partial monitoring, where you don't need to even observe your loss. You just observe some, some surrogate information about the loss. And OK, I didn't talk at all about Bayesian methods, um, which is also pretty exciting. So I think that's the end. I'm like really happy that so many people came. I hope this has been fun. It's been really fun for me. Um, and I hope to see you at conferences, I guess. <laughs> or come to DeepMind. That would be great. Thanks.